Good evening, and thank you for joining us tonight. This is our webinar series on skills that you can learn. Tonight, presenting leading teams and meetings like a boss, we have Sarah May, who is the owner and creator of Sarah Mayer Consulting, and is your go-to expert on organizing your hectic days, weeks, months, into manageable and functional chunks of work. Through her work as a champion for multiple, and I should have practiced this word before I got on because I just got tongue twisted, Multiple charities, I'm going to go with the alternative, Sarah can correct me afterwards, in Arizona and her commitment to the building the capacity of the community, Sarah has personally mastered maximizing every minute of every day to ensure she meets the expectations set before her. Upon her mastery, she began consulting and speaking locally and nationally with others in similar positions. Her clients gain tools to help them close laptops at the end of the day, knowing they've accomplished everything on their team. Sarah is a distinguished Toastmaster and the Palais Verde Division Director. She has received numerous awards, including the prestigious Sandra O'Day O'Connor Community Service Award, founding member of the Joyride Society, serves on the Association of Junior League International Governance Committee, and most importantly, is a licensed foster parent to two dogs and a strong advocate for foster youth. Tonight, have you ever been in a meeting that could have been an email? or been on a team that's just nowhere. Meetings and team results are a direct result of leadership. Leading meetings and teams is an art. Learn the tips and tricks to leading a meeting and team like a boss allowing you to accomplish your goals efficiently. Please, if you have questions, put them in the question box. We will be answering all Q&A at the end. And I am going to pass it over to Sarah. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you, Karen, for having me. I'm thrilled to be here with all of you this evening. And I don't know about you, but I have been in many, many, many meetings that could have been in email or maybe no email at all. So I'm here tonight to talk a little bit about leading teams and meetings like a boss. And oftentimes we find ourselves in leadership positions in organizations, either because we stepped up and said, I'm interested in being a leader, or somebody saw something in us and voluntold us or suggested that we step up. Either way, it's really important as a leader to think about the transition from a regular member or a doer to a leader. So I want to start off with a little flow chart that I like to use. And this flow chart shows the transitions that leaders make when they go from being a doer to a leader. And in this chart, you can just replace the word manager with leader, it, it works the same way. And you'll see on the bottom that everyone starts off managing themselves or leading themselves. And how this works is in an organization, your initial responsibility is to do what you need to do and only worry about yourself. As long as you get your stuff done, you're good. Or if you don't, maybe you're good with that too. And as people move through an organization, either a business or a club or organization they're a member of, and they start to move into that leadership track, they gain more and more responsibility. And they come to that point, that number one, where they will need to make a sharp left turn. There are many left and right turns in a leader's journey. And each one of those turns is a critical point in somebody's development as they are leading people. And as we make those sharp left turns to leadership, the first one is the most critical. Remember, managing ourselves is all about what do we need to do? We don't need to worry about Bob over there or Jane. We only have to worry about ourselves. But when we take that first critical left turn and we start to lead or manage other people, our day-to-day -day work and our day-to-day -day responsibilities change drastically. In many companies, the philosophy is to promote people who are really good at their job. That makes sense, right? 
So if I'm sitting in a position where I have to produce things in accounting and manage certain tasks, and then I do a really good job of that, and now they're like, yeah, congratulations, you're the leader now of the people who do all the tasks you used to do. I already have an advantage because I know how to do their job. However, it's a disadvantage when I take that left turn to become their leader because I know that I can do it and I can do it really well. And it's sometimes that sharp left turn that throws people for a loop because when before they were just producing that work product, when they take that sharp left turn, they know they can do it well, but their job isn't to do it any longer. Their job is now about motivating others to want to do it and to actually get it done and do it well and evaluating how those members do it. So that first sharp left turn into leadership is critical. It's also what shakes a lot of new leaders because a lot of times Somebody's not going to do their job. I don't know about you, but I've been on committees where there's that one person who doesn't do their job. Anyone else? Yeah. So when they don't do their job, the natural reaction for the leader is to get frustrated and say, well, I could do this quicker myself. But in reality, their new role as a leader is not to do it. Their new role is inspiration, motivation, encouragement, decision-making, holding people accountable, and helping them get the work done. So when we make these sharp left and right turns, it's really important as leaders that we think about what is our role now and how will we do this role? Because it will be different. You may be in the same department, but what your job is is very different. As we continue on the leadership path. So now we may have managed or led people who are now the doers, and we, we've got that down. We're able to motivate them and inspire them and get the things done. And then people recognize that we have the ability to do that. And all of a sudden they say, okay, we're going to give you another sharp right turn. And that's now you're going to manage managers or manage leaders. So you're a little bit more, you become a little bit more removed. This is also another turning point in a leader's journey because leaders have to learn then how to teach people, how to motivate, encourage, inspire, hold people accountable and get them to get it done without doing it. So when people start in an organization at the bottom and go up these turns, it is a little more difficult because they still have the knowledge from that bottom level, but that's not their responsibility anymore. Their responsibility is to develop great leaders. And those leaders, remember when they made that first sharp left turn, those leaders are learning how to be leaders. And so it's really about training other leaders. And then all of a sudden, somebody will say, well, you've done a great job. All your managers in your department are doing really awesome. And all your leaders are great. So we want to promote you again or give you a new responsibility. And then comes another sharp left turn, another learning curve into functional managers. So maybe you become in Toastmasters, that might be the club growth director. And now you're not only managing managers, you're managing managers who are managing others who are then managing the doers. And that the, the separation from the work and the leadership becomes a little bit greater. You're leading through others to get the job done. So there's, as you can see, six big turning points in a leader's career in business. And at each one of those critical points, it's important that when you jump into that role or when somebody else jumps into that role, that there's planning, thought behind what that new role looks like and reflection. When we reflect and say, okay, now I'm no longer the doer, now I'm the leader. What should I do? What would motivate me when I was a doer? And how do I do that? And then did it work? 
that reflection will allow us to show up for our teams in the right way at the right time, exactly how they need it. But as leaders, if we're not thinking about these transitions that we're going through or the transitions we're putting other people through, that's when teams go awry. That's when delegation doesn't happen and people are taking over other jobs and people aren't held accountable. But when we think and reflect on the transitions that everybody's making through leadership, it's a little bit smoother. So what do team members really want from our leaders? It's a great question. There's a lot of studies out there, but this one comes from Forbes. And the reality is team members really don't need a lot from leaders. They want clear direction. They want to know what they need to do. They don't need to know everything about what they need to do, but they want to know what's important and they want to know where they need to go. They really want support from leaders. And what does that mean? Sometimes that's time to vent. Sometimes that's time to brainstorm. Sometimes that's just showing that I understand what you're going through and I know this is difficult. Sometimes that's accountability. Some some team members will say, I don't do well unless you tell me what to do. So give me a date and a deadline and I will do it. And that's part of the support. Most importantly, team members want space. They want the ability to do their job well and not have somebody breathing over them, especially somebody who may have had their job in the past, maybe came from that bottom rung. That space is critical to allow people to show up as their best self. Oftentimes, team members show up and they have somebody telling them to do their job every day. And then they think, why do you even need me? Because all you want to do is tell me what to do. So allowing team members to have the space to be creative and to be their best self and do their best work is critical to getting the best results out of your team. And finally, they want praise. They want to know that the work that they are doing is well done and it's seen by others and that they are being really valued as employees. I don't know any employees or volunteers who sign up to do something or go to work and say, my goal this week is to do the worst job I possibly can. Nobody does that usually. Um, So the praise goes a long way. Oftentimes leaders think that there's so much to leadership When really it comes down to these four things, that's what your team needs from you. They need direction, support, space, and praise. Sounds simple, doesn't it? So let's talk a little bit about the indicators of a good team. What what will tell you if your team is functioning really well? The first one is that everybody understands their role. They know what their job is and they know how to do it. They also need to have a clear sense of purpose. Why am I doing this job and how does it fit into the bigger organization? I use a lot of organization examples. A lot of times we have these positions like treasurers or people who are responsible for collecting money. And they think their job is to collect money. That's not really their job. Their job is to ensure the member satisfaction of the organization because the person collecting the money is usually the person who's going to learn first and foremost if somebody's not happy. So if somebody thinks their job is just to collect the money, they may miss the bigger picture of helping the customer or the member in an organization. And when When team members know what the bigger purpose is to their role, they will have more fulfillment in that role. And that's the leader's job to help them see that bigger picture and that clear purpose. Good teams need to have trust. They need to know that they are going to be supported for the work they do. They are going to, the leader's gonna have their back as well as other team members. That's really important that the, the team has everybody's back and trusts that 
they're not going to be backstabbing or stealing work or anything like that. Just like anything, communications and relationships is critical to a high performing team. Leaders tend to have a bigger sense of the big picture. They're privy to more information. And some information can be shared and some cannot, but sometimes leaders just get it because they have all the puzzle pieces, yet their team is struggling because they don't see all the pieces. And the leader's job really is to put all those pieces together through communication, and then that builds the relationships with the team. Good teams are adaptable. Teams that are able to think on their feet and allowed to be creative and think differently really perform really well. Good teams have a process and they also have a process for how they work as a team. It's important as leaders that we sit back and ask the team, how do you think as a team we perform? How do you think we could do better as a team or a group? And when you incorporate that into your process, other than how do I work, and then you have a process for how do we perform as a team, the team will elevate themselves. And so the leader will have a little easier job. Another indicator of good team performance is empowerment. When team members feel empowered to bring solutions and be creative and have ideas and bounce things off each other, that's a good team. So what do teams say about what they want? Team members say that they want three things. They want opportunities to give feedback. They want to be inspired and they want to feel, feel valued. Many times in leadership, we make it so complicated. A team member wants this, 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 and this. No, really they want three things. They wanna give feedback, they wanna feel inspired and they wanna be valued. And as leaders, if we can simplify what we're trying to do for our team and really pour into our team members the opportunity to give feedback and to inspire them and to make them feel valued, they will be happy as a team. Many times new leaders, back to that initial transition, they think that meetings are the answer. How am I going to inspire my team? Well, I have to have a meeting or six or seven or eight or a weekly meeting plus another weekly meeting. And I will tell you that meetings are not the answer to inspiring your team. In fact, there's a lot of data out there on meetings and 78% of people feel their meeting schedule is out of control. And if I were to expand on that a little, that's impeding their ability to get their actual work done because they're in so many meetings. Now, leaders and managers at a higher level, remember, don't have that day-to-day -day work product that others do. So we need to be very careful about the number of meetings because there's actual work that has to be done outside of the meeting. 64% feel the best way to get them excited for a meeting is for it to be well-planned. So those regular meetings that are just on a rotation and then show up on somebody's calendar and the leader's like, oh, I forgot, we have that meeting tomorrow. I'll whip something together. That's not, that's not really gonna fly. Employees think that 10%, 10% of meetings are actually productive. 90% of the time they think meetings are a waste of time. I'm gonna say that one more time. 90% of time, team members think that meetings are a waste of time. And as leaders, our role typically is to set the meeting schedule, to set the agenda, to decide what we're meeting about. And if 90% of the time our team members think those meetings are not productive, they're not getting the best out of the meetings. So if you are going to have a meeting, I have a couple of hot tips that have worked for me. The first hot tip is to pick the best day. And I will talk about that in my next slide. Really thinking about what's going on in your organization 
each week and picking the best day is the key to whether or not you will get the team members full attention or they'll be thinking about all the things they need to do. And then I'm going to throw this little idea out there. Consider having 45 minute meetings that start at 15 minutes after the hour. So work with me on this. Meetings typically start at noon, 11, 1, 2, 3, and they go for an hour. So our brains are trained that if I have an hour meeting, the meeting will take an hour. And so you'll book something, if the meeting's at 12, you'll book something at 11 to 12, you'll book something 1 to 2. And then when the meeting starts to get to like, you know, 50 after the hour, you're going to say, okay, I got to go to my next meeting, let's wrap it up. So people already naturally have this cadence and people aren't going to start to wrap up conversations that could be wrapped up at 1230 because this meeting is booked till one. So they're not going to naturally do that. But if you were to start a meeting at 1215, it does two things. The first thing, it saves you time because it's only 45 minutes and naturally what will happen is that at about 50 till the next hour, so 1250, people are going to start to wrap up their conversations because they have to go to their next thing. But what's beautiful about it is if you're on a 45 minute schedule, your next meeting is not going to start till 115. So between 1 and 115, you can wrap up all the things from the meeting that you just had. I don't know about you, but when I go from meeting to meeting to meeting three in a row, and then I come back with a list of notes of all the things I need to do, it's five o'clock, I might go home, and then it's one more thing I need to do. I never wrap up those meetings. So when you take things down to 45 minutes, you'll find that actually you can probably get it done in 45 minutes. You'll have an extra 15 minutes at the end to then wrap up all the stuff. If you said you were going to do a spreadsheet, if you said you were going to send out something, maybe send out a recap of the meeting, but you'll have those extra 15 minutes between meetings that allows you to kind of wrap those things up, prepare for the next meeting, maybe take a break. That's a big tip. Organizations that do 45 minute meetings end up eventually transitioning to 30 minute meetings. It's natural for the meeting. It's just like a goldfish in a bowl. If the bigger the bowl, the bigger the goldfish. If you put an hour meeting on the calendar, it will take an hour. So let's go back to the pick the best day. What are the best days for meetings? I don't know about you, but this shocked me a little. So the best day for meetings are Fridays. 40% of people say the best days for them to have a meeting is Friday. The second best day is Tuesday at 29%, and then 25% at Wednesday. There were a couple in the Thursday. If you're a mathematician, you can work out that math, and very few on a Monday. And when I look at this, and when I think about meetings, I get why. Monday, most people come into work and they're fired up and they have a whole bunch of things on their mind that they want to do or accomplish that week. So if you have a Monday morning meeting, you're disrupting that, that flow, that pro productivity flow with your team because they may have come to, came in to work all fired up and like ready to go. And then you're throwing all this other stuff at them and they're like, Woo, overwhelmed. Tuesday probably would be a better day. But it's interesting because when you dig into the Friday concept, it's very interesting. Team members say they like Friday meetings because they've typically wrapped up their work naturally. That's a natural cadence. They've wrapped up their work by Friday and then they can really be free in their head to be creative and think about other things and think about the work that's coming ahead rather than be bogged down on all the stuff they need to do. So I would consider if you're looking at 
meetings as a leader, I would consider Friday and think about that. I'm going to say one more thing about meetings. Reoccurring meetings absolutely have to serve a purpose. Meeting just to meet, just to meet does not help. And just because you have to have a one-on-one. So it's really critical to make sure that when you are planning meetings, that they are effective and well-planned. So here's my couple of tips for planning meetings. The first one is have an agenda for every meeting. And this may sound very simple, but I can tell you many leaders don't prepare agendas for their meetings or don't think about what's on the agenda. They're like, well, this is the agenda we always have for staff meeting. We've had it for five years, so we're gonna have this agenda. And if you feel that way about the agenda, I can tell you what the team members feel about the agenda. They think it's the worst, and that meeting is not going to get out of your team what you desire as a leader. The agenda is critical, and it also allows you to really set the stage as a leader to going back to what leaders need to do, they need to empower and inspire their team to get the work done. And that comes from having a very well thought out agenda. Tip number one, plan your agenda so you have a high, if you have any lows in the middle, and then a high again. So you start off on a high note, If you have bad news, you put it in the middle and you end on a high note. That's really important. If you have a big agenda, several hour meeting, a retreat or anything like that, break your section blocks into that same thing. So each topic, if finance is talking, they'd have a high, they'd have a low, then they'd have a high. Some meetings you may have to really stretch to find a high that's a great time to praise your team because the company may not be doing well financially, that may be your low, but your team may be doing really a great job at being creative and being resilient and being resourceful. So use those as your highs. Sometimes you'll have a lot of highs and not very many lows, but put those lows in the middle because you want people to be excited when the meeting kicks off And you want people to be excited when they leave the meeting. Many meeting agendas end with action items. That is the biggest downer on any any meeting. It's like, here's a list of all the things we have to do. So I was pumped up and then now I have this laundry list of things. So if you can end on a high note, that really does change the dynamic of your meeting. The next one is hyping your meetings in advance. This is why it's critically important that you don't just let these reoccurring meetings come up on you. You want to think about the meeting that's coming up about a week before and start to tease some of that stuff out informally. Like, hey, I'm really excited about Bob. He's going to tell us about this new thing he's launching in the department. And you put those things out but you don't give them all the information because that creates hype around the actual meeting and the gathering rather than them coming to a meeting to hear what they already heard from Bob or in an email. So you wanna tease some of those things out. Some organizations have Slack or have Facebook or have internal communications, or when we're meeting in person, you can just walk around and kind of tease those things to get people excited. The hype is what will get people to your meeting in the right frame of mind, and then will also help to get people excited about whatever you're going to say. The next thing is the pre-prep. And I don't mean like preparing the copies or sending out the agenda. I mean pre-prepping people so that they can speak on the agenda. When we manage teams, a lot of times the leaders do all the talking. And when that happens, our team is not as empowered as they could be. So while it may take a little bit longer for Jane to present on the financials than it would for you because you've been in the organization eight years, 
prepping Jane and allowing Jane to present on the financials would be the best use of a leader's time because you're developing her, you're training her, you're coaching her, and you're supporting and empowering her to be a great team member. And Jane will be very engaged in the meeting because she has a speaking part. It also is developing future managers to go up these pipelines and leaders. And then the number one thing, other than not having an agenda that most people fail on is the follow-up. We leave the meeting and we go to another meeting and the meeting's over and there's nothing that's sent out or anything to recap what happened for people who couldn't attend. The follow-up is just as important as the hype that you created because that continues the excitement around the topics you spoke about in the meeting. That allows that, that employee who was a little on the fence or not sure to get more information and have an understanding. And so it's critical that that follow-up is quick, immediate, and it also includes some additional information. So for example, if you're launching a new employee incentive plan and you give somebody 10 minutes on the meeting agenda to speak about it, they can't talk about all the things that are in that plan because it's a 20 page document. That email should go out right after the meeting with the document with maybe another call to action, like attend the webinar Q&A for additional information. But that follow up to that meeting going out in the, in the 15 minutes after the meeting helps people keep that at top of mind and go right back to their desk and be thinking about what they need to do with that. Those are the big tips that I have for planning meetings and leading teams. I'm curious to hear what questions you may have. And I think Karen's going to take those as well. Oh, there she is. Yes. Oh my gosh. That was fantastic. Thank you so much, Sarah. There is the Q&A option at the bottom of your screen for you to send questions in on this. I actually love some of the comments made because I can see exactly how Toastmasters helps prepare this. Oh, I'm seeing that they were shocked by the Friday. That was kind of a big deal there because I'll say that surprised me too because most people want to be done on a Friday. So someone asked, what if different people wanted the meetings on different days? Yeah. I think that as leaders, we have to decide as an organization what the cadence of our organization is. I mean, obviously, if you have a team of 250 people, you're never going to pick the best day. But think about it from a productivity standpoint and a shift. If you have the opportunity for your team to decide, let them decide. But what I will tell you is if you plan the meetings and they are very organized and they're exciting and you have some surprises up your sleeve, it doesn't necessarily matter the day because people are going to be excited about it. But don't pick a Monday. Monday, Monday meetings are a lot of research goes into that. Pick another day and make sure the rest of the organization workflow allows you to have a meeting on that day. So don't pick a Wednesday when you know that there's a report due every Thursday and it takes people hours to do it, if that makes sense. So kind of take a look at that organizational culture, make the best decision, and then go with it, but spend a lot of time planning those meetings. Okay, so this, I think this is a comment, but could also be a question, that they find that a lot of the times their meetings go off agenda and they have a difficult time bringing it back on point. So I think what they're looking for is how do we remedy that? Yeah, that's a great question. I think it's really important on the agenda to put the times. Naturally, you're going to have people in the room who get a little antsy when they start to see that they're coming up on the next person and that person's nowhere there. So you can use the room, the it, well, if you're meeting in person. If not, it's on Zoom. 
but you can use the room to help patrol that. But putting the times on the agenda really helps with that. And then also as a leader facilitating that. So if you're handing it over to somebody to present, naturally helping them to wrap up. Okay, awesome. Mm -hmm. All right, so here's a, a comment slash question again. Well, congratulations. It looks like someone has got a promotion on the way and they've been asked to lead small groups of about 15 people and they're scared to do it. Okay. What are some of the things to get over that? Yeah, I, I think the first thing is to really think about why that person would be tapped to lead groups of 15. And that's probably because somebody saw something in you. Most of the time, that's it comes from a place of somebody seeing something you don't see in yourself. So the first thing is just to know that you can do it and take your time. And lead, leadership is a journey. You don't just wake up one day and they say, well, you're the leader and you know everything. That, that doesn't happen. And people know that. So they know as a new leader that you may not all have, you may not have all the answers or you may not know everything to do. But remember, it's really about caring about your people. They want to know what to do. They want to feel supported and they want to have a clear purpose and they want you to praise them. Other than that, I mean, if they have a question you don't know, I'll get back to you is a great answer. You don't need to know everything as a leader. You need to care about your people and support them. All right. It looks like we only have one more question unless any more pop up. And that is, how can I get to the point where I am seen as a leader to be put into this position? Yeah, that's a great question. I think the first thing to think about when you want to be a leader is to really look at the leaders in your life that have inspired you and Look at the qualities that they embody and then think about all the things that you bring to the table. Sometimes it's about self-promotion. And for some people, they don't like to talk about themselves. So you don't have to do it in a bragging way, but you can use terms for people who are picking the, the leadership positions that allow them to see your qualities in a leadership role. So for example, if my job is to process payroll and I want to be the payroll, the manager, and all my manager hears from me is, hey, did you know I processed the payroll quicker than anyone? Hey, did you know I handled 99 employee complaints? And you're only talking about stuff you did rather than leadership terms like, hey, I, I had some employees that were really upset and I coached them through how to handle that or I was able to inspire Bob to, to participate in the paperless program because that's the best for the company. Though that's thinking like a leader rather than talking about what I'm doing. Because when you are selected as a leader, you, you don't actually have as much to do. I, I always tell the little short story of when I first became an executive director of a college campus. And the first day I sat in my office and I was like, what am I supposed to do today? And I called my mentor. I was like, hey, what am I supposed to do today? And he goes, you'll know when they need you. Just sit in your office. And I was like, well, this is really weird. Like I, I was used to processing financial aid and having a lot of team of people. And like I had stuff to do. I had nothing to do because my job was to support them when they needed me. And so I sat in that office for three hours. And then all of a sudden I had something to do. I had to help somebody who's having a she was having a bad day. She just wanted to come in and vent and tell me about how everything was awry. And that's when I knew my job was very different when I'm leading, when, when I'm leading managers who are leading managers who are leading managers. So you have to start talking a little bit different when you want to move up that role. Awesome. Thank you so much for insights and information, Sarah. It's been very informative. And one of the things that I definitely saw is exactly how Toastmasters helps prepare you for this. Because even right from the beginning, you join Toastmasters, you automatically see leadership right in your first club meeting. But you have a Toastmaster of a meeting, someone who's running that agenda. 
And a well-run meeting starts with that prepared agenda that's been communicated beforehand, that's kept on topic, that's kept fun, kept interesting, maybe themes, table topics, interactive. So right there, all what you were talking about with agenda, we see that the minute you walk in at the club level. And the great thing is, if you're looking for training on how to be that kind of leader that values others meeting times, that's the perfect place to start. Join a local club, learn about the meeting, and then, hey, can I do the agenda? I would like to try and do the, can you're doing, hey, Sarah, you're doing agenda next week. Can I work with you to see how that's done? So you get that training right from the beginning. And as you grow, you get the opportunity to expand in this volunteer organization as then you get to be like the club president. So not only are you overseeing everything on the agenda of the meeting, it's that managing people over managing people. And you get to practice it in a friendly, inviting environment. And it can grow from there with project management, leadership trainings. It's all right there. So if you're watching this and you're like, wow, I learned something today. And this is some, oh, I see a question. All right. We have another question. I'm going to pop that one in right now. This one is, how do you feel about short daily team meetings? For example, 10 to 15 minutes for a small team that is six to 10 people. Yeah, I'll say the same thing. As long as they're just not something I have to go to. So they need to be high impact, high excitement, have a clear purpose, send me on my way to do my work. I like shorter meetings. I think many times we just plop things on the calendar for an hour because that's how long meetings are. I tend to like to get all my meetings down to 30 minutes if I can um, and not on a regular routine. Like I don't like to just say, well, we're going to have a one-on-one every two weeks because we need a one-on-one. I kind of break that up. So I like the idea of little short impactful meetings every morning or every afternoon or however they're scheduled as long as they're well planned, there's hype, it's high energy, high, low, high, that type of thing. I think it's effective. If it's just the thing we do every day, it's not, it's not going to be effective. Yeah, that's fantastic. You're right. Effective is always key. I remember in retail, we have a 10 minute call where we get everyone with them and I'm like, okay, I'm dialing in. I'm going to put it on mute. I'm going to walk around, do other things. And when I hear my name go, Hey, yeah. Okay. Okay. And then put it back on you. <laughs> Those weren't effective. So if this is information that is getting you all excited and you're like, yes, I can learn from this. I can grow from this. What I'm going to challenge you to do is you can reach out to me at cgd at aztoastmasters.org or you can go to toastmasters.org, put in your zip code under the Find the Club and find a whole bunch of local clubs local to you that are meeting and experience this firsthand. I want to encourage you to check out your local Toastmasters club. Go as a guest, visit, see how you feel, look at the training, look at that opportunity. And this is key to helping you get to that next level of leadership, giving you the experience that you can then take back to your place of employment. If you wanted a leadership role, for example, if you're not in a position where you can do leadership at work, imagine going to your box and going, oh, yes, I'm with this organization. And I just took on this role where I'm mentoring three people on how to grow their public speaking ability or how to work in project management or how to fulfill a organized meeting, guess what? Brownie points, ding, 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 straight away in order to help you get promoted. This is a great learning resource, and I would highly recommend that you check us out and visit a few meetings. The nice thing is, if after watching this webinar, you have been inspired and you go and join one of the clubs that are in District 3, which is most of Arizona, you'll know if you're in District 3, just ask the club, hey, are you in District 3? I'm sorry, it's like 99.9% of Arizona, so it's a pretty good chance. You also get a free vintage T-shirt when you sign up, which is extra fun and just a little extra gift because we we just are so excited to have you on board. So if that is all the questions we have for tonight, I am so happy you could join us and join Sarah, and thank you. Sarah, this has been the most enlightening 
discussion on meetings I've had in a long time. I think it's been fabulous. 